Good morning. Let's open our service this morning and stand and sing because he lives. Stand as we sing. seated. We welcome you this morning to Beulah Baptist Church on this beautiful August morning with which the Lord has blessed us. So it's great to have you here. We hope that you are blessed as a result of the service, the singing, uh, the, uh, the sharing of God's word, the fellowship with one another, which is, which is always a great treat. If you're a newcomer with us this morning, uh, we have little blue cards in the pew racks if you would take one of those and complete that and put it in the offering plate as it comes by, uh, that enables us to get in touch with you and let you know how glad we were uh, to have you here uh, this morning. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day with which you blessed us. Father, you bless us in so many ways, and it's tempting for us at times just to focus on the things that we don't have, to focus on the things that we see as being wrong in our lives, the things that we may be lacking, things that aren't going our way. But Father, when we come and, and come before you and we open your word and we fellowship with one another in spirit and in truth, then, then we understand how extremely blessed we are. So Father, we thank you for the health that we do possess. We thank you for the ability to come here this morning. Father, we thank you for our friends and, and family who are gathered here and for the kinship that we share in Christ. And we ask that if there's someone here this morning who doesn't know Christ as Savior, that that person would turn from his sin and turn to Christ and experience the forgiveness that he has to provide. Father, we pray that through every aspect of this service that Jesus would be glorified, that we will look to him, that we will be strengthened as a result of all the things that take place here, and that we will go forth better equipped to serve him and to glorify his name. Father, we thank you so much for all that you've given to us, but most of all, we thank you for Jesus, our Savior. For it's in his precious name that we pray. Amen. Jay, you want to come now and share? Good morning. Good morning. All right. So auctioneer voice announcement so we can get right to David Griffiths, right? All right. Well, too bad I'm not good at auctioneer voice. <laughs> ABW women's meeting will be tonight, 6 o'clock. So uh, come on out, ladies, for that. They're talking about all their upcoming events and have some refreshments there. Now, uh, WANA, guess what? That's starting back up. We've got uh, some uh, registration forms in the back. Now, if you forget to fill one out, don't worry. Your kids can still come. But this is just so you can get a head start and everything. So that'll be right after Labor Day, that Wednesday there after Labor Day. So. Uh, Awana is going to be here before we know it. And they're still looking for some volunteers, so if you can help with that. Uh, see Lisa there with everything there. All right, and then our church picnic next Sunday. So church is going to be for, uh, providing the chicken and, and uh, all the you know paper products and all that. So if you can bring a, a couple side dishes, and then uh, the, the pool there down at Castle Creek is going to be available. And and there's basketball down there and all that other stuff so come on out we'll have a nice time with that all right and then uh let's see you got the insert there operation christmas child there now it's mentioned in there that uh, all the back to school stuff's on sale out in the, sc in the schools and that sometimes those are really good for stuff in your shoe boxes so be aware of that the life choice center while you're shopping there you might let's see if there's some of that on there a bunch of retreats and other meetings to check out on there so please be aware do, do, do. All right, that, that. Oh, and then, yes, there's another insert in there that uh, Ohio Amish country bus trip. There's a real nice, uh, for, you know, they've got everything spelled out there. A tentative uh, itinerary, all the prices on there. So be sure to check that out. The bus trips are always a lot of fun, and we usually get some great stories from them. So uh, 
If you're interested, please sign up there. All right, let's see, what do we have? I know there was one picture out there. Megan is the uh, athlete that was featured in the, in the Read Between the Lines this week. She had a big interview there, so be sure to check that out. You can get to know Megan a little bit more for her senior year there. So we seem to be going through the church. So who is next with our, our student athletes here? So, uh, but be sure to check Megan's out. If you, if you didn't get the paper itself, you can go out to the Mountain States and website and there is a link there that you can read everything on, on there. So it was, it was really nice there. So good job, Megan. All right, let's get to our birthdays. We've got uh, Randy Bollier, Dan, Daniel Dowdy, Jerry White, Tia Dye, Hayden Robinson, Jamie Knight, and Carol Morgan. And then uh, anniversaries, we've got Greg and Sabrina Weber and David and Donna Jolliffs. So happy birthday, happy anniversary. And our scripture reading comes out of Luke. And Terry gets to come out and try his auctioneer voice on the scripture reading. Maybe. Good morning, everyone. Scripture comes out of Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. There were present at the season some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Were those 18, or were those 18 on whom the tower in Salem fell and, and killed them? Do you think they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Thank you, Terry. And if our ushers will come, we'll take up our morning offering. <laughs> Jim Sweeney, if you'd pray for the offering, please. This time we've got some special music from David Griffiths.
this morning. I'm a little tired, but I'm here, and uh, I'm going to try to drag myself across the finish line. It's, it is good to be with you folks, and it's, I've said it before, it's one of my favorite places to sing, sing. especially Miss Marilyn right there. She smiles the whole time. I love her. She's got the prettiest smile, and it's contagious, And uh, but I love singing here. It is it's one of my favorite places to sing. Y'all act like you love me or something, or at least like me. It's uh, easy to return it. it. When someone loves you, it's easy to return love, right? So uh, I do. I enjoy being here with you folks. Well, I'm going to do one more here for you. And uh, come by and see us at the table after the service. We have some CDs. Hey, I, we've got some CDs, but pray with us. I'm really excited. Uh, we started working on our new album. I've got the music done for it. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, this past two studio, the studio that we were using, uh, uh, one, of the, one, of the head, one of the head guys that runs it and stuff, he had all his Grammys up there on the shelf. He's a Grammy winner, and he was in there playing the drums, and he was the percussion guy for us for the album. I was like, well, I'm in here with a bunch of Grammy winners, and, uh, but uh, I'm really excited about where it's going, and uh, they got 
got done playing. They got done playing one of the, the music for one of the songs that I wrote, and uh, they come back into the engineer room where I was sitting, and uh, they were like, "And this is what tickled me." They said, "Man, that's going to be really good. I really like the way that music, how you wrote that music, and how that was written out." And I was like, "What the hell? Grammy winner said he liked my stuff." <laughs> and so I'm really tickled. Come back and, and check our CDs out. We're hoping and praying that we have this new one out by uh, the middle of next, right after Labor Day is what we're kind of pushing for. So uh, we're really excited about this new one. But come back and see us. We've got our stuff back there. But uh, I'll leave you here with one more. I did this in the morning, this early service. But uh, I love this old song. It simply says, he'll be there. When you are lonely, he'll be there. When you are discouraged, he'll be there. When the road you're walking seems too hard to bear, Jesus will. Thank you, David, for those messages and song. And I shared in the first service, and I'm going to do it again here real quick. Uh, it goes perfectly with the song he just sang, but uh, you all see David up here, and, and we love to have David with us. And, you know, he travels a good long ways to be here. Uh, they got here last night. They did a concert with his brother, Jonathan, and, and uh, cousin Stephen. He, he said that they hadn't sang in 15 years. You wouldn't have known it. They were very, very good. And if you were here, you were blessed by that. The first thing David said when he got here last night was that <clears throat> he'd been having car trouble. Something was going on with his car. But he decided that, you know, a lot of effort had been put into this concert, so they were just going to come and, and uh, trust the Lord to provide for them. And they stopped in Shinston to visit a pastor friend of theirs and uh, went back out in the car. The car wouldn't start. So uh, the pastor friend said, well, just take my car. His son was a mechanic, and he said, I'll have him look at your car. And if they can't fix it, you can just take my car back to, to Kentucky with you until we can get it fixed. But long story short, as David and I were walking out to the car, he got a text that said, uh, your car is fixed. My dad's got it. Come get it. Amen. So it's just a, you all don't know all those kind of things that go on in the background. 
And that it's just the, the Lord provides when we do what we're supposed to. And the other thing was his cousin was here with his eight-year-old son, Preston, wonderful man of God. Got in a truck last night at 8 o'clock because he had to drive six hours back to Kentucky so he could preach at his church this morning. So, and thankfully he got there. I asked David this morning. But just a lot goes on to these things, and, and the Lord provides for those that will do his will. So just wanted to share that because David didn't do it. So let's take our hymnals. Turn to 49, 489. Glory to his name. And we'll let the kids go ahead and go downstairs for junior church. 489. Stand as we sing. As Joy plays the next verse, get around and greet each other very quickly this morning. And the last verse. Come to the fountain so rich and sweet. Cast thy poor soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge into day and be made complete. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory
tell you, that's one of the best parts of church. It's just getting around and hugging one another and talking and greeting each other. And uh, just nothing beats good Christian fellowship. Uh, and, and some folks say, well, you know, I could just stay home and, and watch church on YouTube or watch some other preacher on television or Internet or whatever. And you can do that, but you don't get the fellowship. Uh, and you miss all that. So the Lord's created us where we just need this. And so it's just a boost. Uh, when we get around and encourage one another. So, but uh, also uh, for David Griffiths, there, there's buckets in the back. Uh, so if you would like to give to support his ministry, uh, there's two buckets there on each side of the doorway as you go through. Uh, I think there's two back there. Uh, but uh, anyway, just uh, make, you know, contribute something there. And he's got some CDs. Um, so uh, make sure you stop there on the way out. Um, okay, it's, it's time for our, our prayer time. And, and it's always a, a privilege to go to the Lord in prayer, uh, and this is, this is a very important part of the service. Uh, not only do we fellowship with one another and we come together in that way, but we pray together. And now you could pray individually and pray in your homes, and you should, uh, but coming together as God's people to pray, there's just something very special about that, and that, that's biblical as well. Uh, so, uh, but uh, let's, let's pray for all the requests that are in the bulletin. We've got a lot of things there, as we always do. Uh, folks who are ill, uh, some other requests that, that, uh, that are mentioned there. And if you happen to uh, notice that there's not a name there that needs to be on that list, please let us know and we'll, we'll get that uh, added. And then if you see someone there who's doing much better or needs to be removed from the list for whatever reason, let us know and we'll, we'll fix that as well. We want to keep it as current as we can, but we need your input. Uh, in, uh, in doing that. So, but in addition to all those requests, uh, we want to focus on a few things this morning. First of all, we want to pray uh, for all of our, our uh, students and teachers and parents as, as back to school season is now upon us. Uh, some are already moving into dormitories. Some are getting ready to do that. Some are buying school supplies and, and that sort of thing. So everything's gearing up uh, for school. And this is an important transition time for a lot of our students. So pray for them all the way down to the youngest, uh, to those going off to college. Uh, and then, of course, pray for the parents as well, because in many ways it's harder on the parents uh, than it is on the students. Uh, so uh, pray for them. And then just pray for the teachers. Uh, we're so thankful uh, for the teachers that we have. So pray that God works through them just to mold and to shape the lives of these children. Secondly, we want to pray for our nation. There's been a lot of things in the headlines this last week or so, uh, different kinds of tragic events, uh, different, just different things uh, that, that are there. And so, and it just calls us to prayer. Uh, when we see that those things, that's the first thing we want to do, and I'm going to share a lot more about that in the message this morning. Um, so, but let's pray for our, our country, pray for our president, our Congress, our Supreme Court, uh, all of the federal leaders, uh, that they would go in the direction that God would have them to go. Uh, not their own direction, but God's direction. Uh, and then pray for our state leaders and our local leaders. All of them need prayer, and we're commanded to pray for our leaders. Uh, and so let's do that. And then third, let's pray for the lost. Uh, pray for those folks that, that are in your family or at work, or perhaps you have folks, you know, when you head back to school, you're going to see them there. Uh, but pray for at least three or four folks by name that they'll come to know Christ. Uh, and pray that you'll be a part of that, uh, that process. So Always remember to pray for the lost and ask God to use you uh, as a part of that so you can witness to them and share the gospel uh, with them. If you have a, an unspoken request, uh, feel free to lift that up to God in prayer as well, and, uh, and we'll, we'll certainly take care of that. I see a hand way in the back. Judy. Okay, the first responders. Okay, so let's pray for first responders and, and those who uh, lost folks in that, that accident she mentioned. So, okay, well, let's remember all of these things uh, as we go to God in prayer. Um, and uh, we'll have a few moments of private meditation. If you would like to come forward and, and kneel down at the altar, feel free to do that uh, during this prayer time. Uh, but we'll have a few moments of private meditation, and after that we'll be led in our praying together. So let's pray. <laughs>
Heavenly Father, this morning we thank you for the promise of your word that says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Father, those words are directed to us as your people. And so, Father, may we be faithful to pray to you for our own sins, to humble ourselves, to come for you and realize that, that we too have sinned, that it's not just the sin of someone else, it's not the sin of our neighbor, it's not the sin of the leader, but it's our own sins that plague us, and it's our own sins from which we're in need of a Savior. And so, Father, this morning we come before you for those of us who know Christ. We thank you that his blood is sufficient not only to save us from our sin, but to sanctify us, to set us apart, to enable us to serve you, to empower us to grow. And so, Father, this morning may our hope always be in Christ and never in ourselves, and may our confidence always be in his righteousness and never in our own. Father, this morning, we thank you for Jesus. We are so blessed as your people. And Father, it's all because of your grace. It's all because of your mercy. It's all because of your, your loving hand has reached down and brought us out of our sin and set us on a new path and given us a new heart and a new life. Father, we praise you for all of that this morning. And Father, we pray for those who are unsaved, for those who still do not know Christ as Savior. We pray that you would convict them of their sin, and that you would draw them to Jesus. Father, we pray this morning for all of the, the teachers and the students and the parents that are going through this back-to-school time, that you would guide, that you would provide. Father, we pray for the teachers that you would continue to use them, work through them as a part of molding and shaping these younger lives. And Father, we pray for parents that you'd help them as, as they see their, their little ones growing up more and more and, and heading towards adulthood faster than they'd like. But Father, that's a part of living. And may we most of all entrust the children that you've entrusted to us into your hands and to realize that it's our responsibility and it's our duty to train them and to instill in them the the words of life of the gospel and then to to turn them loose to allow them to live the lives that you have set before them but may we be faithful to provide them with a good solid biblical foundation upon which they can build as they grow older father we pray for our country we are in such great need, Father. We have sinned. It's not just the sins of someone else. It's not the sins of the shooter. It's not the sins of, of the person who's been arrested for various kinds of transgressions. It's, it's not the sin of others, but it's our sin. Father, forgive us for our wickedness. And Father, may we always find our hope in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And may we look to him as a nation and turn to him and allow him to do his work in us. Father, we pray for the lost, that you would use us to reach them. May we always hold them up to you in prayer, our lost relatives, our lost friends, our lost family members, co-workers, classmates. Father, may we pray for them by name and ask that you would just do a mighty work in them through us and through others to bring them to Jesus, to transform their lives and to to give them new hearts that are inclined to serve you. Father, we pray for other requests that are here this morning, for all of those who are on our prayer list, for those uh, that we have heavy on our hearts and minds. 
May we cast those cares upon you and realize that as we do so, that you'll sustain us and that you'll work in the lives of others. Father, as we open your word now, may it speak to our hearts, may it enlighten our minds, may it empower our wills. For it's in Jesus' precious and powerful name that we pray. Amen. Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 5 is the passage for this morning. So if you haven't already turned there, please do so and just follow along with me uh, through that passage this morning. It was a horrible, heartbreaking tragedy. While people were worshiping their Lord, their lives were suddenly and unexpectedly taken from them. Now, had the massacre been in a public area, it would have been bad enough. But this shedding of blood took place in a house of worship. And so the questions could have easily been asked, well, what is happening in this world in, in which we live? Do, do people no longer have any decency? Do people no longer have any respect for human life? What in the world is this planet coming to? Now, what I'm describing here is not from the recent headlines of the last few years, it occurred over 2,000 years ago in Herod's temple. Jews were worshiping there, they were offering up their sacrifices, and because there was such tension between the people of Judea and Rome, the Roman governor Pilate took their lives at the very altar, a group of Galileans who were there, where they were offering up their worship. For the Jewish people, this incident was a national tragedy. Now, Rome was, was hated and, and a feared occupying presence. And this slaughter was just one of the many reasons why the tension between Judea and Rome was so great. It's very likely that it was the talk of Jerusalem for, for some time. Had there been cable news shows back then, it would have been on 24-7. A Jewish massacre by the Roman governor in the sacred temple it struck at the very heart and soul of the Jewish people. They were shocked, they were grieved, and they were angry. And so this morning's passage describes how the situation was presented to Jesus and the instructions that he gives in response. Now everyone here is aware of the horrible mass shootings that occurred a week ago. One mass shooting enough is heartbreaking, but this time two of them occurred back-to-back back on a single weekend. It's the latest in the series of, of a national violent string of tragedies. Now everybody's talking about what needs to be done and what should be done. And the responses that are being provided cover this wide spectrum of ideas. Well, God's Word has some very clear guidance as to what God would have you and me to do in light of such a tragedy. There are three specific things that the scripture indicates for you and me to do when it comes to a biblical, godly response. Now, what you hear a lot on the media today, you hear all kinds of political responses. You hear all kinds of, of other kinds of responses, secular responses, but there are biblical, scriptural responses that we find here in this passage. It's always wise to us to go to God's Word and see what God's Word has to say on a particular issue, and God's Word addresses this as well. So first of all, when national tragedy strikes, talk to the Master immediately. Talk to the Master immediately. Verse 1 of this morning's passage says, there were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Now the wording of this uh, particular verse comes across as describing a very recent activity. It was fresh in their minds and, and it was shared with Jesus. Now most likely the ones who were describing this situation to him, they, they wanted to know what he thought should be done. And, and just as with the violent shootings today, pretty much everybody has, has an opinion as to what is and, and what should be done. Well, in this case, they wanted the input of Jesus. Jesus, what do you think? 
Now, it's not clear as to why they wanted that, that response, whether they wanted him to educate them or, or whether they wanted him to take their side in, in demonizing Pilate and the Roman government or somebody else. But regardless, they shared the situation with Jesus and they were seeking his opinion. It's the first thing you see in this passage. Now, the first thing, then, that you and I should do in response to a national tragedy is to take it to God in prayer. Now, last Wednesday night in Bible study, and you're missing Bible studies, you're missing some great discussions, uh, but we were sharing our frustrations over the growing criticism that's, that's being leveled at folks who say that they're, they are giving their thoughts and prayers to folks who have experienced loss as a resort, a resort of violence. And so the idea is, is that basically that, that people just need to do something that will make a difference rather than kneeling down before their creator. The thinking is prayers don't prevent people from getting shot. You need to do something on your own is the idea. You need to react. You need to take matters into your own hands. You need to do something right now. Saying that you don't need God saying that, that your own answers are sufficient, that you must take matters into your own hands, is the height of human arrogance. That kind of mindset that turns up a nose at Almighty God, insists on doing things in one's own way, and one, in one's own time, is the main reason we're in this situation today. Saying, God, I don't need your input. I don't need your guidance. I don't need to spend any time in prayer. I'll do things my own way. Thank you very much. That's the essence of sin. You want to do things your way rather than God's way. So because society has insisted upon doing things more and more its own way rather than God's way, you see this downward spiral, and it just keeps showing up in the headlines again and again. And then when people attempt to turn to God and ask for help and relief for grieving victims, they are chided for doing so. When you are faced with a tragedy, whatever the nature of the tragedy may be, whether it's personal or whether it's national in nature, the very first thing you do is take it to the master in prayer. That's the biblical, godly response, and don't let anyone convince you otherwise. Psalm 55, 23 through 23, Psalm 55, 22 through 23 says, Cast your burden on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. But you, O God, will cast them down into the pit of destruction. Men of blood and treachery shall not live out half their days, but I will trust in you. Psalm 147, 3 also says, He heals the brokenhearted. He's the one who binds up their wounds. And then 2 Corinthians 1.3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. If there is anything that a troubled, grieving country needs, it is the comfort and hope that only Almighty God can provide. So first of all, we take it to the Master in prayer. When national tragedy strikes, that's the very first thing to do, and keep on doing it. Keep praying, keep asking for God's favor, keep asking for his mercy. Second, when national tragedy strikes, assess blame accurately. Assess blame accurately. Verses 2 and 4 say, and we're, we're dividing this up a little bit differently because Jesus addresses two situations here, but he says the same thing about them. Verses 2 and 4 say, And he answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans? because they suffered in this way? Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than the others who lived in Jerusalem? Now, the tower of Siloam is also mentioned here, and it's most likely it was, it was a part of the, the wall that surrounded uh, Jerusalem near the pool of Siloam, so it was called the Tower of Siloam. And for some reason, uh, while it was being built or while it was being repaired, it fell and 18 people were killed in the process. Now, the common thinking, the conventional wisdom of Jesus' day was that whenever there was a tragic death or whenever there were a group of tragic deaths, it was because of a specific sin on the part of the people who died. 
And so a few of them may have also looked to Rome, and because there was no love lost towards the Romans, we've already talked about that. But what Jesus identifies here is the most popular notion. They were more sinful. There was something that in their lives that just wasn't right, and so this tragedy fell upon them. So these people must have done as something especially wicked to, to, to deserve such a horrible fate. The people of Jesus' day were basically trying to assess blame. Why did this thing happen? What can we do to avoid this in the future? Now, whenever something horrible happens, it's human nature to identify who or what is at fault. That's, that's, that's a timeless type of thing. Pointing fingers was common in Jesus' day, and it's very common today. You see all kinds of that. But the problem here is despite the conventional wisdom, the people were missing the point. They were assessing blame in the wrong places. So when Jesus asked these two questions, he's challenging the common thinking. And he does this in a very discreet way, but he does it in a very direct way as well. He, he asked twice. He says, do you think? So Jesus is saying here, basically, you're wrong, and you don't know as much as you think you do. Do you think? Do you really think this? You're assessing blame, and you're pointing fingers in the wrong directions. Just as it was then, so it is today. Now, if you've watched the news at all, you don't need much description as to what people are saying is the cause for all the mass shootings and things that takes place. People are saying a variety of things. And the short list of them includes uh, the, the, there needs to be more background checks for guns, and that needs to happen. That's, that's the reason it's all these gun owners. Uh, the next one is, is it's Trump's rhetoric. It's all about Trump, and it's all his fault, so it's, he's the one that's to blame. Others would say it's the media that's to blame. They hype these things up too much. Others would say it, it's lack of attention to mental health disorders. We need more red flag laws, and the lack of those, that's to blame. Others would say too many people are on psychiatric drugs, that's to blame. Now, when you hear one or more of those things, immediately probably some kind of a, 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 a alarm goes off in your mind. You think, I know that's not true. I know that's not right. And so our tempers begin to rise. That's the human response to assess blame. That's my response. You and I have a tendency to assess blame quickly and to assess it wrongly. And that's exactly what Jesus is saying here. That's the reason why we need to seek God's wisdom rather than relying upon ourselves. Proverbs 11.2 says, when pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with the humble is wisdom. Proverbs 26, 12 says, Do you see a man who is wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. James 1, 5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. Where do you find wisdom? You find it in God's word. 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 through 17. It's a classic passage. It says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. One of the main reasons is our society is in such a mess is that people are biblically illiterate. When national tragedy strikes, assess blame accurately. Don't be so quick to do it and make sure you're asking for God's wisdom and looking for his input when you do. And Jesus here, as he's responding, he sidesteps. There may have been some wanting to draw him in one direction of the debate or another direction of the debate. He sidesteps all of that and gets to the very heart of human nature, which is exactly what he needed to do and is exactly what you and I should do today. You can't assess blame accurately until you've consulted the Lord through Scripture. You need to do that. Third, when national tragedy strikes, repent of sin personally. Now, this is the place in this whole passage where Jesus throws this out, and he does it twice, and it, it has to throw his hearers for a loop, and, it, and it's somewhat shocking for you and I to read these words as well. Listen to what he says, verses 3 and 5. No, I tell you, but unless you repent you will all likewise perish. And then he says again, no, I tell you, but unless you repent, you all likewise will perish. 
Jesus says the same thing twice, just in case they didn't hear him the first time, I guess. Perhaps it's because it's so radical and it's so contrary to human nature, he wants to make sure that he's heard clearly. Surely the last thing on people's minds in Jesus' day and age when it came to this topic was their own sin. It was the sin of these people that had suffered these tragedies. It was, it was all upon them. It was their fault. It was somebody else's fault. But it wasn't their own sin. And yet Jesus tells them to look into their own hearts for there's wickedness there as well. So they were focused on the sin of the people who died violently in these two events or perhaps the sin of Pilate. But, but their own sin? Now, some today, some, today, some people may say, uh, well, I hear of, the, of the, all these horrible things one after the other. You mean it should motivate me? To, me to repent? It's these other people. Yes, Jesus is saying here that you need to repent, or you too will perish. The people that were talking with Jesus were convinced that they were morally superior to the other folks who, who were involved in these tragedies, Jesus is saying, no, you're not. And today it's rebellion against God that has gotten us into this mess. Individual rebellion against God. It's rebellion against God down through the ages that's been the source of repeated tragedy, suffering, and death. And just as it was in Jesus' time, so it is today. We need to look in our own hearts. When we see these tragic headlines and heartbreaking headlines, and we see all the wickedness in society, we need to understand that's a reflection of your heart and mine. It gives us insight into our own depravity before God. Listen to Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. It says, as it is written, none is righteous, no, not one, no one understands, no one seeks God, all have turned aside, together they have become worthless, no one does good, not even one. That means you, and that means me. 1 John 1, 8 through 10 says, if we say we have no sin, and these verses, by the way, are written to, to Christians. It says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Now, some of you are sitting there and you're soaking this up and you've read all the headlines and you've had venting sessions with other people about all the wickedness in the world and, the, and how everybody else seems to be dropping the ball. And, and it will preach, I, I just don't get it. What's the connection between my sin and mass shootings or other national tragedies? The greatest need of the world today is people to be right with Almighty God. That's the greatest need. That's not going to happen without people taking responsibility for their own sin and their own wickedness and turning to God in repentance. Jesus says, unless you repent, you too will perish. Human nature is to pass the blame to somebody else. And we love to pass the blame. I, I, I'm human, I love to pass the blame. So usually something goes wrong in the house, it's Jeannie's fault. Uh, and so it's not my fault, it's her fault. Uh, and so, but you see that, I mean, and that happens in marriages, it happens with kids and their parents, it happens with uh, all, all kinds of relatives and, and coworkers. We tend to pass the blame. That's fallen human nature. The problem, the situation, the, the crisis, whatever it is, it's always somebody else's fault. And so when we go through these national tragedies, we're always wanting to blame somebody else. It's their fault. They're so wicked. And yet Jesus says, look within your own hearts and repent of your own sin. After Adam and Eve sinned, it goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. After Adam and Eve had sinned, God confronted them about it. You know the passage in Genesis 3. Uh, God's walking through the garden and, and Adam, Adam's hiding. And, and so basically they have a conversation and and so Adam basically says, it was all Eve's fault. I mean, this thing of husband blaming the wives just started early on. Uh, it was Eve's fault. She's the one that gave me the fruit and I ate. And then so Eve has a discussion with the Lord. And, the, and, and Eve says, nope, it was the serpent's fault. The serpent, he's the one to talk me into it. And so I did it. It was all his fault. Now, the point of all this is, what we find in the Garden of Eden and what we find in this passage today, is don't pass the buck for sin. 
Don't blame somebody else for your own transgression before Almighty God. Come to grips with your own sin and your own constant need for a Savior. Don't think you're morally superior to others. And that's the great temptation in these times because we kind of get on a moral high horse and we start lecturing others and pointing fingers at others. And Jesus is saying to them then and to us now, look within your own hearts. Repent of your own sin. The horrible things that you see in the papers and on the television, on the internet, they are glimpses of the true darkness within you. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Now, when I see all these things and when I realize how sinful that I am, then I realize how much more that I need Jesus as a Savior. And I am much more grateful for having my Lord and Savior who has brought me out of sin and continues to perfect me as flawed as I am and one day he'll present me faultless before Almighty God because of what he has done on the cross. Listen to these powerful words in Ephesians 2 verses 1 through 5. It says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now work in, at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh. We were all once there, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But it doesn't stop there. But God, being rich, in mercy because of the great love with which he has loved us even when we were dead in our trespasses made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved Amen. Acts 4 12 says and there is salvation in no one else and there is no other name given under heaven by which we must be saved so in the darkness of this present age repent of your own sin come to grips with your own wickedness and let your light for christ shine brightly let your life glorify him let your speech glorify him let all that you do point others to christ because it's christ that they need most first timothy 1 verses 15 through 16 is a good testimony for you and i to have here in this time of, of increasing it seems wickedness and evil Christ Jesus, and Paul is writing these words, by the way. Paul, who wrote a large chunk of the New Testament. Paul, who started all these churches. Paul, who was such a great leader and an apostle of the Lord Jesus. He says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Christ Jesus might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. So when national tragedy strikes, and it will surely strike again and again and again, will you accept responsibility for your own sin? Will you come to grips with your own wickedness and confess your gratitude for Christ Jesus as your Savior and Lord, and then allow your light to shine brightly? Will your life and your words point others to Jesus as he is revealed in his word and perhaps you don't know Christ there is no hope for you apart from Christ as Acts 4 12 says there is no other name given under heaven by which you can be saved Jesus Christ is the only way that's not my saying that that's not Beulah Baptist saying that that's Almighty God saying that there is no other name under heaven by which you must be saved you must come to Christ for forgiveness of your sin he's your only hope but when you turn to him you find mercy, and you find grace, and you find eternal change that no man or no legislation or no policy can provide. This morning, will you turn to Christ? This morning, will your confidence be in Christ? This morning, will you share Christ with others? Will you make that your goal? Will you make that your heart's desire? Will you make that the focus of your prayers? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, this morning, we cannot begin to, to thank you enough for the insight that your word gives to us. Father, we, we think we're so smart. 
we think we're so intelligent. We think many times that we have things all figured out. If we just pass the right kind of legislation and we just do the right sorts of things and, and dot all of our I's and cross all our T's, well then somehow we can figure out things on our own or if we do something else, some other policy or don't have this or that or the other. Father, may we understand that our only hope is turning to Christ. We are depraved human society. We are fallen in sin. People are not basically good. People are basically evil. And we see that in the headlines today. And we see our need, our, our crying need for a Savior. And Father, may we come to grips with our own wickedness and our own sin. For in doing so and allowing Christ to have full reign in our lives, then we become a strong witness and a force for change in the lives of others. But not until we do that. So, Father, may we follow the words of this passage this morning so that in this day and age in which we live, that we may be effective, strong witnesses for Christ and so that we may see people brought out of the depths of sin, turning to Christ and experience the forgiveness and the new life that only he can provide. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Our hymn of invitation this morning is number 222, There is a Fountain. We'll do the first and the last verses. If you're here and you'd like to come for prayer and just kneel down at the altar, we'd love to have you do that. If you want to pray for our country and just come to the front of the altar and kneel and pray, do that. But if you'd like to come and, and confess Christ as Savior or rededicate your life uh, or join this church, you do that as well. But our hymn of invitation is number 222. Let's stand as we sing. Bob Withers, would you close us in prayer, please?